印太战略的真正的目的是企图搞印太版的北约，维护的是以美国为主导的霸权体系。To equate NATO to the Quad really doesn't make sense. A new arc of autocracy is instinctively aligning to challenge and reset the world order in their own image. 美英澳核潜艇合作构成严重核扩散风险。I can assure you, no U.S. president will send any single American soldier to fight for the independence of Taiwan. China Coast Guard, China Coast Guard, Indonesian Coast Guard calling. If you ask me, is our relationship normal today? My answer to you is no, it is not. And it cannot be normal if the situation in the border areas is abnormal. This is a new world disorder. Watch out. There is definitely a danger of war. July 2021, a major naval exercise is hosted by the U.S. and Ukraine in the Black Sea region. The exercise involves navies from 32 countries. When a British destroyer enters what Russia considers its territorial waters, Russia is provoked and almost fires at the British battleship. President Putin started the war in Ukraine, but some analysts point to examples like this to back the claim that NATO's behavior provoked Russia. Certainly, NATO expansionism is not a valid reason for invading a country. Any invasion of another sovereign state, unless it's an act of self-defense or endorsed by the UN Security Council, is by definition illegal. Many in China have a different view of how events transpired. The Chinese government's narrative puts the responsibility on the US and NATO for the Ukraine crisis. As cities in Ukraine burn and millions flee, the Chinese media runs stories with quite a different focus. 二月二十六号，美国驻乌克兰大使馆在其网站上删除了所有有关五角大楼资助的乌克兰生物实验室的文件，这表明五角大楼不想让公众看到这些文件。基里洛夫表示，在乌克兰已经形成了一个由三十多个生物实验室组成的网络，那这些实验室的任务是由美国国防部下达的。The United Nations declares it's not aware of any biological weapons programs. But the story continues to be pursued in China. And the U.S. Embassy's Weibo social media site gets inundated with hate messages. Chinese public opinion on the U.S., which was bad to begin with, plunges to a new low. Over in the U.S., a momentous shift in U.S. public attitudes toward China also took place as the Ukraine war continued. A poll observes the proportion of Americans seeing China as their greatest enemy. It doubles in just a year, from 22% in 2021 to 45% in 2022. 7th of March, 2022 the day of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's annual media briefing. He uses the occasion to deliver a warning.
，图共赢的共同愿景背道而驰，注定是没有前途的。That is some strong language by Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Your comments, please. Well, one thing we should be very clear about is that the biggest geopolitical contest of all time in human history has just broken out. Between the United States and China, whenever major geopolitical contest breaks out, watch out. There is definitely a danger of war, and that's precisely why everybody has to be very careful and work hard to avoid the war、uh, before it breaks out. And we mustn't put our head in the sand like an ostrich and say, "Hey, everything is okay." No, everything is not okay. The Indo-Pacific strategy was announced by the Biden administration, and its key thrusts include a free and open Indo-Pacific, supporting India's continued rise in regional leadership, strengthening the Quad, strengthening extended deterrence with Japan and South Korea. Expanding U.S. Coast Guard presence, contributing to an empowered ASEAN, and closing the region's infrastructure gap through Build Back Better World with G7 partners. The strategy paper does not mince its words. Competition with China is stated as an urgent challenge. The United States is a proud part. Of the Indo-Pacific, and this region is critically important to our nation's security and prosperity. Our exports to the region support four million American jobs, and in 2019, the United States conducted nearly two trillion dollars of two-way trade here. All of which underscores America's connection. To the Indo-Pacific. In this region, we have long put forward a vision of peace and stability, freedom on the seas, unimpeded commerce, advancing human rights, a commitment to the international rules-based order. We know that Beijing continues to coerce. To intimidate and to make claims to the vast majority of the South China Sea, and Beijing's actions continue to undermine the rules-based order and threaten the sovereignty of nations. The United States stands with our allies and partners in the face of these threats. America's military strategy is now. 集团政治的代名词。我们看到美方打着促进地区合作的旗号，玩弄的却是地缘博弈的把戏。从强化五眼联盟，到兜售四边机制，拼凑三边合作伙伴关系，收紧双边军事同盟。美国在亚太地区排出的“五四三二”阵势。带来的绝不是什么福音，而是搅乱地区和平稳定的祸水。This is very dangerous because such attempts may not only miscalculate and may also lead to very dangerous courses of action. Now, with Ukraine in the middle of this war. Hundreds of millions of people are suffering. Millions of people are fleeing the country. For example, we need to realize the value of peace and stability. We do not want to be hijacked by any single big country in the world onto the bandwagon of war. The Indo-Pacific region is much more heterogeneous than NATO.、Uh, they have the same political systems. They have similar economic standards, and,、uh, and they're well integrated into, into each other's economy. 
where Southeast Asia and Japan and Korea, we have a variety of government styles, we have a variety of commitments to democracy, a variety of development levels. To equate NATO to, uh, NATO to the Quad, it really doesn't make sense. When parties reference NATO, they're actually um, often referring to Article 5, which states that um, there is mutual defense in the event of an attack of any one state. The U.S. knows that it would be a fool's errand um, to uh, seek to uh, bind countries in the region uh, to a mutual defense treaty because, you know, Southeast Asian countries in particular all have different interests and different uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis China as well as one another. I do not think that um, the U.S. is trying to build NATO in Southeast Asia. As a majority of Australians condemn Russian action in Ukraine, Australia's leader makes an important speech about a possible new world order. Our rules-based international order, built upon the principles and values that guide our own nation, has for decades supported peace and stability and allowed sovereign nations to pursue their interests free from coercion. This is now under assault. A new arc of autocracy is instinctively aligning to challenge them and reset the world order in their own image. A day after the speech, the Australian government announces plans to build a nuclear-powered submarine base on the country's east coast. The cost? 10 billion Australian dollars. The base will facilitate the docking of nuclear submarines like this one. The sudden announcement of plans for the base is an acceleration of what was originally an 18-month evaluation process. The AUKUS agreement was signed between the US, UK and Australia in September 2021. Under AUKUS, the United States and Britain will assist Australia in its acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines. Australia's top intelligence chief warned that China is intent on establishing global preeminence and says its troubling strategic convergence with Russia will pose new threats to liberal democracies like Australia. How did ties between Australia and China get so bad? From 2009 to 2019, trade between China and Australia tripled, transforming China into Australia's largest trade partner. China has also emerged as Australia's largest source of international students and Mandarin as Australia's second most spoken language. In 2014, both countries even described their relationship as a comprehensive strategic partnership and signed a free trade agreement. In 2017, 54% of Australians polled had trust in China to act responsibly in the world. So between 2009 and 2019, Australia's trade with China tripled. Uh, that was largely driven by this huge increase in demand for products, particularly commodities, that helped to fuel China's growth. Two-way trade between Australia and China was extraordinarily high. 40% of outbound trade from Australia went up north to Beijing. That's one of the highest levels of trade uh, between advanced countries and even between any countries in the world. Then in 2017, trouble started. There was first a government study, and then it began to work out into the public that there was increasing Chinese state interference inside of Australia. Uh, there was a well-publicized story of an Australian politician, an Australian senator, 
taking money from a CCP-linked entity and then copying China's talking points in contravention to where his own party stood. 1.2 million Australians are Chinese or of Chinese ancestry. Now, what we saw was increasingly the Chinese government was reaching into various ethnic communities in a number of different ways. So first of all, working to control the Chinese language presses, making sure that individuals and companies had no funding for independent journalism if they said anything that was contrary to the line of the Chinese state media organs. Number two, we saw that increasingly within communication systems, WeChat and others, that various channels of conversation were shut down on, particularly around election time, when anyone said something that was in contravention to how China viewed the situation. At one point several years ago, Australia was in the midst of negotiating an extraterritoriality uh, agreement with the Chinese, whether or not, uh, you know, those who have been accused or convicted of crimes can be exported back to their own countries. Uh, this was a contentious debate within Australia, particularly as China looked increasingly authoritarian at home. But the Minister of State Security from China was down talking about this and called in Labour, who was in the opposition, and to Labour leadership said, you need to support this because if not, it would be awful if the entire ethnic uh, Chinese population in Australia all of a sudden left you and supported a different party. That is not even a veiled threat. That's an out and out threat to change your domestic politics to make sure that they align with what China wants. And that set off alarm bells within Labour Party, no less within the government, the Liberal Party as well. In 2018, 52% of Australians polled had trust in China to act responsibly in the world. That same year, Australia passed the Espionage and Foreign Interference Act, which was implicitly directed at China. The government also announced that Huawei and ZTE were not allowed to build the 5G network in Australia. Then, in 2020, the pandemic gripped the world. When the Australian government suggested an independent investigation into where the virus started and how it spread, China was and remains outraged. Canberra's relationship with Beijing is now at rock bottom. What followed was a trade war. Beijing has launched a second investigation into Australian wine imports, accusing Canberra of giving subsidies to give firms an edge over local rivals. Australia says a coal import ban by China would be a clear breach of WTO rules. China has suspended indefinitely high-level economic talks with Australia. Beijing says the decision affects all activities under the China-Australia strategic economic dialogue. In 2020, 23% of Australians polled had trust in China to act responsibly in the world. 77% did not trust China to act responsibly. Now, when that economic hammer began to came, come down, you can see widespread anger and a push swelling up from the ground up that the Australian government needs to do more to promote trade with other countries. In 2021, 16% of Australians polled had trust in China to act responsibly in the world. 84% did not trust China to act responsibly. In September 2021, AUKUS was formed. Our world is becoming more complex, especially here in our region the Indo-Pacific. This affects us all. The future of the Indo-Pacific 
will impact all our futures. And so friends, AUKUS is born, a new enhanced trilateral security partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States. AUKUS, a partnership where our technology, our scientists, our industry, our defence forces are all working together to deliver a safer and more secure region that ultimately benefits all. The first major initiative of AUKUS will be to deliver a nuclear powered submarine fleet for Australia. The UK, Australia and the US will be joined even more closely together, reflecting the measure of trust between us, the depth of our friendship and the enduring strength of our shared values of freedom and democracy. So AUKUS has broad bipartisan support in Australia. In fact, both the government that signed it and the opposition party have signaled that they are uh, on board for this. And all three countries, uh, Britain, the UK, and the United States, are working overtime uh, to make sure that the way that they go about setting up the nuclear propulsion submarines does not enhance uh, nuclear proliferation and in fact might even be able to strengthen it by limiting it just to this technology and making sure that there are no bleed on effects to nuclear weapons. That's not what this is. Although there's a lot of dis disinformation in the system that this is a gateway to a nuclear weapons program, which both parties have said it is not and they will not continue it if it is. $10 billion to spend on nuclear submarines is a lot of money. Do Australians really believe that China is going to sail all the way down under and launch an offensive? What's happened in the South China Sea has not stayed in the South China Sea. And as China has continued to build up their military forces, they've continued to push outward and further down and closer to Australia. So we've seen multiple attempts uh, by the Chinese to do a similar uh, spate of building that they conduct in the South China Sea in the South Pacific. We've seen discussions and talks about whether or not there would be a dual use military commercial base in Papua New Guinea, in Vanuatu, and even just this past month in the Solomon Islands. All of these are much closer to Australia. The AUKUS Treaty is a very dangerous thing because Australia for all these decades has claimed itself to be a very proud member of the Non-Nuclear Proliferation Treaty and a proud member of the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone. And as a result, they benefited hugely from this. And I think now, at urging of the United States and United Kingdom, the Australian government wants to deprive the Australian people their rare privilege of living in this bubble of nuclear-free South Pacific or protection of the nuclear free uh, non-proliferation treaty, this is dangerous for the Australian people as well as for countries and peoples in our part of the world. Submarines are stealthy, but trade agreements are stealthier. So it's much better to protect security in this region by countries developing patterns of cooperation and interdependence, as we are going to do with the world's largest free trade agreement, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that was uh, uh, launched in January 2022, with, by the way, Australia, Japan, South Korea, China, uh, also as members uh, of this um, trade agreement. The Quad, or Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, has Australia, Japan, India, and the US as member countries. There are joint military exercises parallel to the dialogue, like Exercise Malabar, a naval exercise conducted off the coast of Guam. The exercise began in 1992 between the Indian and US navies. Japan has been a permanent partner in the exercise since 2015. In the 2021 edition of Exercise Malabar, Australia participated for the second time. As the Malabar exercise drew to a close in 2021, 
India rolled out the red carpet for U.S. defense officials in New Delhi. The Quad countries present a different point of view. Besides military exercises and security discussions, the Quad includes cooperation on vaccine partnerships, climate change action, counterterrorism, and infrastructure development. If you looked at the Quad three or four years ago, it would have been focused more on maritime security. Today, the Quad has evolved to focus on the provision of public goods, so vaccine production in India and distribution to emerging countries, the provision of infrastructure and connectivity aid to Southeast Asia and South Asia, and we also see now investment in the selective diversification of supply chains throughout the region. So I think that is important from Japan's point of view in that uh, it's providing a public good to the critical re partners, uh, as Japan understands, in the Indo-Pacific, and that's Southeast Asia and South Asia. Without shifting away from a security uh, st a view of the Quad, um, it's not going to get buy-in from Southeast Asian countries, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore. The Quad members have collectively pledged to donate more than 1 billion doses of vaccines globally by the end of 2022. In Southeast Asia, a hotbed of U.S.-China rivalry, the Quad has gotten a mixed response. Southeast Asia in general has been more wary about the more muscular, security-oriented um, dimensions of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, and the Quad is one of that, or at least was one of that. Um, I think their main concern with the Quad was that it would heighten uh, tensions in the region, especially vis-a-vis -vis China. I think the quadrilateral security dialogue, dialogue has also positioned itself. It's moved away from its more militaristic elements to focusing on areas that ASEAN cares more about. So areas like pandemic recovery, and that by demonstrating a sensitivity to the region's needs, I think the position on the Quad dialogue has softened somewhat. The Quad is, a, is somewhat of a mystery. If you talk to the members of Quad, they deny that it is an anti-China alliance. But everybody in the world perceives the Quad to be an anti-China alliance. And it creates this rather strange situation where the four countries deny that it is aimed against China, but the perception is that it is against China, which is why, if you notice, uh, not many other East Asian countries uh, have volunteered to join it. And so uh, it's therefore important for the members of the Quad to actually explain what exactly is the end game of the Quad. If you look at the uh, last Quad foreign minister's joint statement, ASEAN centrality was right up at the top. Everybody understands that the thing that brings the four Quad members together is their shared anxieties about China. But the Quad members also understand that the way they prove that they're worth siding with is by delivering public goods. Might there be deeper engagement between ASEAN and the Quad? Developments in the South China Sea are likely to steer the conversation. China Coast Guard, China Coast Guard, Indonesian Coast Guard calling. One hour away from Singapore, Work has commenced on a U.S.-funded Indonesian Maritime Training Center. 
The training center will be owned and operated by Indonesia's Maritime Security Agency, Bakamla. Bakamla is a coordinating board for maritime security. It's an interagency department responsible to safeguarding the maritime security in Indonesia, and it involves Navy, the Ministry of Fisheries, as well as other ministries, relevant ministries. It is led by a Navy admiral. Indonesian Navy plays a big role in the day-to-day -day work at Bakamla. Batam, the location is very strategic. It is close to the Strait of Malacca as well as the South China Sea. Indonesia needs to upgrade its uh, Navy and also its maritime capacity. Having defense cooperation is one of the best ways for that purpose. And we are aware that the U.S. has a lot at stake in defending the freedom of navigation in the Strait of Malacca and the South China Sea. According to the U.S. Department of State, Indonesia received nearly $39 million in the year 2020 from the U.S. Part of the funds are targeted for spending on military education, military financing, and security assistance. The Bakamla project is of significance because Bakamla is the agency tasked with overseeing Indonesia's territorial waters and its exclusive economic zone. Bakamla has intensified sea patrols in recent years after Chinese fishing boats, escorted by the Chinese Coast Guard, sailed into what Indonesia regards as its territory. Beijing, of course, has a different view on who owns these seas. China Coast Guard, China Coast Guard, Indonesian Coast Guard calling. What you calling me? This is China Coast Guard answer. Yes, sir. Please move away and go back to your territory, sir. No, no. We are coming out of the in the sea area under the jurisdiction of the People's Republic of China. China has an indisputable sovereignty over the island in South China Sea. I order you, sir, to leave this territory. I order you to leave this territory. Take your fishing boat or leave them away. This event occurred at the Natuna Islands in the South China Sea. China claims most of the South China Sea as its traditional fishing grounds. Around October 2021, China sent a diplomatic correspondence to Indonesia, demanded Indonesia to halt the drilling activities in the Natuna waters. It's oil drilling. It's uh, uh, for, for, for Indonesia part. So we have drilling activities within the Natuna waters, within our maritime rights. They said it, uh, it is within their so-called historic rights. Mm. I think this is a bit unfortunate for both sides because, uh, in my opinion, China should not drag Indonesia further into the whirlpool of the South China Sea. The waters in the Philippines are much more turbulent. In May 2021, close to 200 Chinese vessels were moored in the contested area in the South China Sea, prompting fears that Beijing was building a naval base there. We now understand why it is that the Philippine authorities now have taken such a tone of concern and a tone of defiance against China um, in terms of what's going on in the West Philippine Sea. We saw nothing less than what you would call a swarm of Chinese vessels, particularly in areas that are close to the artificial islands that are built by China. Uh, one particular reef was quite unsettling to see. It's called Gavin Reef. Um, around it, it, you could see easily 100 ships 
and it's it's quite hard to be accurate about it from a moving plane up above, especially since some of these ships are being tied together um, and just to appear as one group. Uh, we, we saw similar uh, formations in Julian Fadisalita Reef just a few uh, weeks ago. Responding to the events in May 2021, the Foreign Affairs Secretary used less than diplomatic language. He later apologized. More recently, in March 2022, a Chinese Coast Guard vessel sailed dangerously close to another vessel from the Philippine Coast Guard. With a distance of just about 19 meters, accidents are not unlikely. In the last year or so, there have been a lot of movements in uh, the West Philippine Sea concerning Chinese militia chasing um, Filipino fishermen who are fishing in, in our own waters. When we speak of Filipino fishermen, usually these are just small boats, trawlers. They're not organized at all. The militia, on the other hand, they have been proven to be organized efforts. They have bigger boats, more sophisticated technology and equipment, so they can really track down uh, where, where the Filipino fisher folks are um, and chase them down or chase them away from supposedly Chinese waters. Many believe it is China's assertiveness in the South China Sea that is giving a boost to the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and things like AUKUS. When you talk about the South China Sea, just allow me to make several very brief points. We do not need to go further into Asian time. We can just go to the end of the Second World War. I do not need to remind all of us that during the Second World War, Japan was occupying all the islands and reefs and atolls in the South China Sea. When Japan unconditionally surrendered in 1945, do you know to whom Japan surrendered all the islands and reefs and atolls in the South China Sea? Japan unconditionally surrendered everything to China. Why? Because it was dictated partially by the United States. It was because during the Second World War, China was the only country standing on its feet in this part of the world, fighting against Japanese occupation. In 1945, there were no independent Vietnam, there was no independent Malaysia, there was no independent Philippines, there was no independent uh, Indonesia, for example. All these were still colonies. Okay, this is a bit sensitive, but I'm trying to uh, to clarify this, okay, uh, no available historical record can show if China performed uninterrupted, continuous act of sovereignty over the Spartan Islands prior to the Japanese occupation in 1939. And after the Second World War, Japan relinquished the title over the Spartan Islands, but it was not clear whether any party or any state would inherit the claim. So there is no historical uh, document that supports uh, Beijing's claim. The Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague dismissed Beijing's claim to much of the South China Sea in 2016. As Filipinos go to the polls, the issue has been a subject of debate. If you look at existing public opinion surveys, a lot of Filipinos would like a government that would be more assertive, that would use the arbitral ruling, that would exhaust uh, all means, and, and that would not adopt a, a defeatist uh, attitude towards the issue simply because we're up against a, a major power. 
and in this campaign i think a lot of the presidential candidates are tapping into that by saying that i will be stronger than uh, the current president the current administration i would be more assertive in 2020, my colleagues and I conducted a study on um, perceptions of the Filipino strategic community uh, regarding which country would be our preferred partner. Our majority of them actually said that they prefer to be partners with Japan, the United States, and Australia. So these are our traditional partners. Um, China is way down in the list of preferred partners. The China factor does play a very big role in the Balikatan exercises. They are also holding exercises regarding Patriot missiles of the United States. So we can assume that this is part of the different theater scenarios. And this is likely in preparation for China's next move in Taiwan or whatever might happen in the South China Sea. The Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict or war has uh, uh, been a an important uh, debate uh, in the Philippines. There's this um, chilling effect to a lot of other small states that if um, behavior like this by superpowers are tolerated, then, then no small state is safe. A lot of people are saying that now there's an opportunity for other hegemonic powers to also flex their muscle and impose their view of regional orders here in Asia, particularly uh, China and uh, given its uh, assertiveness in the South China Sea, for example. If, for example, after the May 2022 elections, existing military arrangements with the United States would be reinvigorated, that means that U.S. presence would be what we will see in the coming years. Because prior to the end of the Cold War, the, the largest military installations outside U.S. territory is in the Philippines. Uh, the Subic Naval Base and the Clark Airfield were critical in the projection of, of U.S. military power in its wars in Korea, in Vietnam, and in other places in the Asia Pacific. In case of a flashpoint happening in the Taiwan Strait, then the Philippines can be requested for these logistical hubs to be used. But I think it really depends whether the new administration after the May 2022 elections will be a bit more open or flexible to this. The United States made a major mistake in underestimating Duterte's chances and not developing a relationship with him before he took office. So then Washington was blindsided by this new president's anti-Americanism when anybody could have told him that Duterte had been anti-American since his college days. Uh, I think now you're going to see the U.S. much more aware of the fact that the alliance is strategically too important to play games with like this. The U.S. must engage with whoever wins. And look, Americans don't get to vote. It doesn't matter if the U.S. government likes a certain Philippine president. It doesn't matter if that would have been their preference. The U.S. government's job is to uphold the alliance commitment to the Philippine people, whoever their president is. The Philippines and the U.S. are now beginning to have the kind of conversations that the U.S. has had with Japan and Korea and Australia and NATO for three decades. And part of that conversation is obviously what are the Philippines' responsibilities, including if there were a contingency on Taiwan that involved danger to American service members. Chi 把南海建成和平之海, 友谊之海,
I think um, Southeast Asian countries need to stop thinking or stop framing their choice so much as a choice between the United States and China. Rather, they need to think about the choice that lays before them as one that um, uh, supports a rules-based international order and the rule of law, or a world where you know might uh, becomes right. And to me, the choice is very clear in that situation. I choose the former. I would not like to see um, the world, and particularly not the region, descending into a situation where might is right. And we've seen um, what happens in a scenario such as that in the case of Russia's inv invasion of Ukraine. It's a new giant in our neighborhood, but that doesn't mean we kowtow. But we must, be, we must speak to them clearly and firmly, but not provocatively. And that can be done. You know, I was a diplomat for 33 years. They say that a definition of a diplomat is someone who can tell you to go to hell in such a way that he feels he's going to enjoy the journey to hell. Now, this, this is the art we have to learn to do. We have to tell China to go to hell on some issues, like the South China Sea. But we do it in such a way that the Chinese are going to enjoy the journey. So that's what diplomacy is about. Uh,